Good afternoon. It's Friday, April 12. I'm Andrea Chisholm with the Midday News. Special welcome to those watching on onespotmedia.com. The government has suffered a major blow after the Supreme Court this morning struck down the National Identification and Registration Act. A panel comprising Chief Justice Brian Sykes, Justice David Batts, and Justice Lisa Palmer Hamilton ruled that the act was null and void. Chief Justice Brian Sykes explains the ruling. And we were of the view that the protections such as they are in this statute were inadequate and therefore a violation of the right to privacy. Having declared some of the provisions in violation of the Charter. We were of the view that what was left could not stand because on two bases, one, that it was so bound up with the other provisions that there is no way it could survive by itself. That's one route. And the other route was that what was left would still be in violation of the Constitution. And so on either basis, we were of the view that what was left could not stand by itself. And so we were of the view that the National Identification and Registration Act is to be declared null and void and of no legal effect. The NIDS bill was passed in November 2017 after much protest by the opposition. Opposition senators also walked out of a sitting, arguing that the bill was being rushed through Parliament. In the meantime, PNP General Secretary Julian Robinson, who took the government to court over NIDS, has reacted to the ruling. The victory today is a victory for the Jamaican people. We took this action on their behalf because we felt, based on the provisions in NIDS, that it challenged the constitution, the constitution and it infringed and abrogated the rights of Jamaicans. The decision today is a vindication of the value of the Jamaican constitution and its charter of fundamental rights and freedoms and the right it gives to every Jamaican to ensure that the laws which Parliament enacts are consistent with the charter of rights. The decision, especially for parliamentarians, is a, ensures that our duty is to make sure laws we enact are consistent with the constitution. A less hurried approach, and I want to emphasize that at all stages of the game, we encouraged, we persuaded, we asked the government to refer this legislation to a joint select committee so that it could benefit from um, the input of Jamaicans here abroad and subject matter experts. The government refused to accede to those requests, and as such, we are here today. We believe that in all things the Constitution must triumph and that is what we see today, that the people's voices were heard. We had significant concerns, as some of you might know, I'm a senator, and we actually sat until 1.20 Saturday morning working on this act to try and make it more palatable. In spite of the 168 amendments which we took in the Senate, we still recognize that it was flawed and all our entreaties to the government to stop, pause, let us sit down and work it through were just totally ignored. Now we know that Jamaica can benefit from having a national identification system, but that system must never impair the rights of the people. We reaffirm that we are in support of a national identification, identification system. This challenge was never about preventing the government from implementing a ID system. What we were against were the provisions in the act that we believe to be unconstitutional, which the court has upheld. And in response, the Office of the Prime Minister, OPM, says the government is respectful of the court's ruling. In a two-paragraph release, the government said it would spend time reviewing the judgment and will provide a fulsome response at a later date. 
under the National Identification System needs, the plan was for Jamaicans to get an identification number or card to access goods from a public body. It was also mandatory for Jamaicans to give up biometric data, such as an iris scan, for example, to access the number or card. In other news, more details are emerging following the murder-suicide on Waltham Park Road in St. Andrew Wednesday morning. The latest involves the Firearm Licensing Authority. TVJ's Ashane Masters has details. The Firearm Licensing Authority, FLA, has revealed that it had taken away the licensed firearm belonging to the correctional officer involved in the murder-suicide following reports from the police but returned the weapon two years later. There have been subsequent reports that there had been several incidents of domestic violence involving the couple Patrick Goins and Rolene Clark Goins. And on Wednesday morning, Mr. Goins reportedly cornered and shot his estranged wife, then killed himself with their 12-year-old daughter as a witness. Chief Executive Officer of the FLA, Shane Dalling, told RGR's Beyond the Headlines host, Dion Jackson Miller, last evening, that the authority first received a report from the police about Mr. Goins eight years ago. I'm perusing the file and I saw that um, there was an, a report from a far back in 2011. And what a report from, from whom? From the police, stating that they had a, this, there was a dispute and that they're referring the matter to the FLA. And then what happened? An investigation was completed and uh, after the investigation, Recommendations were made, and the board made a decision that the farm should be returned to him. That was in 2013. Mr. Dadden explained that the firearm was returned because the FLA was unable to get any information from the affected persons or community members. He said close family members were not interviewed. Based on what I'm hearing in the public domain, the family members lived in Kingston, and at the time, the victim resided in Portmore. You mean so they weren't interviewed? I don't think they were because they... But that must be a huge gap though, Mr. Darling. I mean, no one, even if community members don't know, even if workplaces don't know, often family members would know what is going on. That sounds like a huge gap in there. No, it's not. Because um, when you think about it, if you do community checks and you visit a home to find families all the way in Kingston, Manchester or so. It's not as easy as that in terms of conducting the investigation to locate family members right away. Mother, father, brothers and sisters to interview if they are not living in the area or persons in the community are not aware of their location. Mr. Dalling says Wednesday's incident is a third murder-suicide involving a licensed firearm holder since the start of the year. O'Shane Masters, TVJ News. You cannot win this war. Stop taking innocent lives. That's the message from the mayor of Montego Bay to criminals following an increase in murders in St. James since the start of the year. He's calling for the government to take action before the situation gets out of control. More from TVJ's Prince Moore. 2017 was a sad year for St. James with 335 people murdered. In 2018, a state of public emergency SOE in the parish was praised for a 22% decline in the murder figure. But since the end of the SOE in January this year, crime is again an issue in St. James. We have seen a, a massive increase if I'm to look at the percentage. And that was up to, I think, one day this week. So at that time, there were 23 murders. There are now 42, which would represent some 80% or more increase. A concerned mayor of Montego Bay, Homer Davis, notes that most of the crime is due to turf war. People are fighting for turf. People are fighting for supremacy. And, you know, I keep asking the question, when will it end and when will it stop? And what is the end result? What do they expect to achieve at the end of this? He wants the government to intervene to help to keep the crime rate down, even while stressing his confidence in the work of the security forces. But I would encourage our citizens to be, to be more vigilant. The police has recovered more firearms 
at this time more than what they had recovered last year. And so the police are doing their job. He was speaking at the Municipal Corporation monthly meeting yesterday. Prince Moore, TVJ News. The St. Elizabeth police have charged the man accused of attacking two police officers last week at the Junction Police Station. Chris Lloyd Elliott has been charged with assault and unlawful wounding. At the monthly meeting of the St. Elizabeth Municipal Corporation on Thursday, Superintendent Catherine Lord said Mr. Elliott is still in hospital. The two police officers involved in the incident are both off-duty and recovering from injuries. Superintendent Lord was also concerned about the location of the station and the number of persons of unsound mind roaming the streets. She's calling for an interagency approach to deal with the problem. Meanwhile, a man of unsound mind is said to have allegedly stabbed another man to death in Mountainside St. Elizabeth yesterday. The deceased has been identified as 28-year-old Mikhail Blake. Sometime after 7 o'clock, Mr. Blake was at a shop when the mentally ill man walked up to him and used a knife to inflict wounds in his chest. Mr. Blake was taken to hospital where he was pronounced dead. Residents say Mr. Blake would normally provoke the mentally ill man who is still on the run. A member of the clergy has supported the Kingston and St. Andrew Municipal Corporation's decision to stop giving homeless people food on the streets. Instead, the homeless will get food at specific locations. We have more in this report. No more feeding the poor on the streets of a corporate area. The announcement from Kingston's mayor raised eyebrows, but General Secretary of the Jamaica Council of Churches, Reverend Gary Harriet, says the church is willing to cooperate. We interpret the call from the municipality as not discouraging the feeding of persons on the street, but doing it in an environment in an environment that is conducive for you know hygiene, their well being, etc. And so yes, we would we would stand with any such direction that would affirm the dignity of our people and treating them in the best way possible. The municipal corporation met with church groups and other stakeholders on Monday and outlined the decision to allow feeding programs for the homeless in designated areas. But at least one group, feeding of the 5,000, is concerned about the capacity of the facilities. The facilities that they are offering us to, to feed the homeless, the amount of homeless that you see in downtown Kingston alone, those facilities really can't hold all those persons. So many people are homeless? Yeah, you have, you have quite, because we do, we, we, we give around like 500 lunches yeah. at Christmas season, and sometimes we do have more persons other than that. In the meantime, Reverend Harriet is urging other entities to help in coordinating the efforts to facilitate the homeless. So I think it is going to be important. There are ministers for turners around, so it is going to be important maybe to contact ministers for turners and to see what the best way possible in terms of facilities that churches have and how to really care for our people in, in, a, in a situation where it affirms their, their, their personhood. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe other organizations need to come on board as well to support the effort so that persons who need help to get to these places can be facilitated. Machine Masters, TVJ News. And that's the Midday News. I'm Andrea Chisholm. Join us at 7 for the Primetime News Package. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.